Hello, folks. Welcome to Between Awesome and Disaster. This is your host, Will Carey. I appreciate you tuning in. I hope you are doing well. Hope you're staying safe. I hope you're feeling inspired and optimistic, because uh, that's how I feel after uh, four days of watching uh, coverage of the Democratic National Convention. Uh, there is a an energy uh, and a sense of hope that I am feeling now that I was not feeling a couple months ago, and I think that I am very much inspired uh, in a way that I haven't felt before uh, to be on the front lines, so to speak, of uh, this of this election season because, and this is my one of my favorite refrains I kept hearing uh, from the convention coverage, uh, is we're not going back. And I think that is an incredible refrain. And I certainly hope that uh, you feel the same way and I feel like you might. Um, Folks, on the show today, a uh, very, very cool, very exciting uh, guest. Uh, my guest on the show today is a Canadian punk rock legend in my book. My guest on the show today is Stuart McKillop, formerly of the band Daggermouth, and he's here to talk about his current project, which is an excellent uh, punk rock band by the name of Precursor. If you are into uh, 90s era emotional melodic hardcore, uh, be it your lifetimes, uh, that that sort of scene of punk rock, uh, the band Precursor and their new album Thick and Thin is absolutely for you. And I got the opportunity uh, to talk to Stuart. And not only is he a guitarist on, on this album, but he is also the producer, uh, the uh, engineer, the, the guy behind the recording of the album. And I learned so much, uh, from talking to him, uh, over the, the course of this conversation, especially a lot of things, cause I'm very much in a band centric, uh, frame of mind right now, as you've heard me talk about my current and new project, uh, skip lag, which uh, I've been having a joyous time, uh, sharing information and, uh, and promoting our newest single, Rhode Island, which is out now, as opposed to just making silly videos. Uh, I love uh, that I get to hear the song over the course of promoting it because it's a genuinely great song. And I am even more excited to talk to you guys today and share information about the creation of Precursor's uh, newest album, Thick and Thin, which is out now everywhere you get your music. And we're going to talk to Precursor uh, guitarist and uh, recording master, uh, Stuart McKillop. And uh, let's go and chat with Stuart now. Okay, this this is sort of making a lot of sense because when I listen to to the new the new al the new album uh, Thick and Thin, um, mm. there is, and and I'm reading a little bit of like it, it's there's a lot of that sort of like impassioned. Uh, there's a lot of like in. Uh, impassioned, uh, gritty, anthemic angst that I yeah. am very much here for. Uh, it's just all over this album, dude, and I love it. Yeah, there's there's a lot of uh, themes of addiction and suicide and things like that going on. Um, yeah, it's it's been in our circle for the last while. So uh -huh. there's a Dan was really letting it out, which is great. Gotcha. So, and similarly, like, think again, like going back to this idea of, of environment, I can just, I can feel like, cause he, it, from what I, I, what I was reading, like he was dealing with some very like serious shit in yeah. the course of making this record. Yeah, ex totally. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's, it's a Vancouver, such a crazy place. Like you said, you're surrounded by beauty, but when you get in close, there's, there's some real filthy stuff going on in there. And and mm -hmm. it's it's not something that can be solved in in a day or two, you know. There's there's a lot of right. trauma and then and the result of trauma is what you're seeing in the downtown east side. Yeah, like, exactly. Like you have to before you can pave over the cracks, you have to pull people out of the cracks it, that like a dish. Exactly. Is yeah. For them. Yeah. It's a very rough neighborhood. It's gotten way rougher since covid as well like uh -huh. you know we're getting stabbings almost every day and there's you know so much garbage on the streets it's it's mm -hmm. it's pretty overwhelming but uh yeah it's 
I don't really know what else to say, <laughs> to say about it. It's, uh, we've well, lived with it for, for a long time, and and I feel like it's not something that's gonna just go away. And it's a uh, it's a pretty in depth problem. You yeah. know, like the, no. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, no, I, no, I, I, I do abs- absolutely. So I feel like that's sort of this like collective experience, and especially for for Dan, is like really uh, coming through when it comes to this record. I and let me yeah. ask ask you this because, um, uh, because you you recorded, mixed, and and mastered. Did you produce this album as well? Yeah, yeah. So, I I wrote like most of the songs. There's a couple songs that our other guitar player wrote. But musically, I did most of the writing and and producing, and and uh, Dan does all the lyrics and the vocals. Mm-hmm. And then there was a couple songs where I didn't feel like they were quite there, so we just totally wiped them off the, wiped it away, and made them come back with another one, another idea. <laughs> and finally, a couple of them stuck, and it was good. It's nice. It's nice to push him. It's he's really great, but you know, like having someone to push you. A little further is always a good thing and he gets mad at me for it but he still loves me so <laughs> <laughs> well well that's that's good and i i want to ask about that you sort of your role of of i think shaping the the album because i'm assuming like you know a bit about what he was going through in his his life at this time when these lyrics come out so oh when for he sure come, so when he comes to you with this uh heavy like life experience especially like, coming out of the pandemic like suicides Mm -hmm. and all this kind of stuff when he comes to you with this like how do you process like what he's telling you and then help him shape that into to art into the songs uh well i try not to show any emotion when i'm doing uh recording vocals because i find if you show if i'm showing emotion i'm gonna throw him off his game Uh so i try to be like a little robot until until the end and then if it's not good i'll you know lay it down for him lyrically his stuff's always good so i never have a problem with them with it lyrically it's always just melody and pace whether the song is too you know if his vocal pace is too slow or too repetitive then that's the kind of input i give i never give input on on uh actual like content behind the lyrics because mm-hmm. i feel like that's that's his story to tell not mine but uh you know if something's not up to snuff i'll tell him and he always fixes it. <laughs> <laughs> was there a song in particular that you remember that underwent a really uh, extensive like rewrite or changed dramatically from the final? Part? Yes, uh, and I can't remember the name of it right now. I have to look it up on the computer <laughs> really quick because <laughs> all the songs to me are just song one, song two, song three. Uh, <laughs> I, I I know what you mean. I, I do the same thing. Or you do like the joke titles, like like when my band is writing songs, I'm like, oh, this is our Jimmy Eat World song. I'll come up with a name a little ex- bit later. Exactly. That's what we we did. And this one was, uh, where is it here? Sorry, I'm a little slow with this. Oh, it was awesome. For the Last Time, that song. That one got redone twice. And it was just the pace he kept. He, he kept having a little bit of a slow pace to it, and I was like, "No, the songs. This is one of our slower songs. So you got to be the the pace to it. You got to be the one that makes it sound like it's a fast punk song." Mm-hmm. No, so that, that, that sounds, was that sounds great. Thanks, man. Yeah, yeah. That that was the only one that was like we we redid a couple times to to get it to finally sit. And when he came with the last the last version, I was like, "Yep, that's it." And he said he was listening to lots of Taylor Swift to get his his pacing down, <laughs> which, I, is, which is funny. <laughs> I I love I love that. I, I I think she is a bigger uh, fan and supporter of like this of the scene than I think most of her fans would realize. I know a lot of people oh, yeah. were really excited when she mentioned the starting line in a, a song recently, but like she she's like done collabs with like videos with like Jimmy Oop world she's done like dashboard confessional like if you go way back uh she looks like a total scene girl from like her the early myspace days if you go far enough back yeah uh she's like popping up at blink 182's australia shows they're going to see her i if if i had my druthers if i if if i could just put this on the universe i think she would make an amazing pop punk album if oh yeah decide to do it i think she'd knock a pop punk album out the get park. her and paramore together to make a record to be like the ultimate pop punk record 
Yeah, and like and like Travis Barker produces and plays drums. I think yeah. that would be amazing. That'd be wicked. Uh, I yeah, would... they would definitely take over. <laughs> for sure, sure. Um, I wanted to ask you about another song that I really liked on the record because I think uh, for the last time, uh, and especially how it like comes starts uh, coming out of "Don't Throw Your Life Away," mm -hmm. um, very similar. I thought uh, worked lovely, but I wanted to ask about the closer of the album, uh, "Broken," which. I, I love that it ends with this sort of like very like intense emotional acoustic song after we've been mm -hmm. like just knocking out punk rock bangers the the whole album. Um, what do you remember about how that song came together? That song came together actually when we were recording the drums in the studio. Uh, our other guitar player, Travis, just happened to be playing some riffs. And was, I was like, what is that? And then he had an, he had, you know, a few parts and we, got an acoustic guitar into the studio right away and we just laid it down just because you need a nice room to record acoustic in. We, we did the rest of the record yeah. in my garage, right? So right, right, <laughs> you, need, yeah. you need like a nice open space to do acoustic guitar. And so we just quickly fired off all the parts. And then once we got back to my place, we put it together as a song and added all the Omnicord and, and that kind of stuff. But we were mostly going like, I just wanted to have something that was different on the record and mm -hmm. I didn't want to slow down the pace of the record by putting it somewhere in between. It was kind of supposed to be like almost like a secret song kind of, you know, remember in the nineties when there used to be a secret song at the end, I do. something funny or an acoustic song. So we were just kind of wanted to throw like a Jimmy Eat worldly kind of ballad at the end of the record. <laughs> like a, my sundown thing. I love that. dude. Yeah, um, exactly. Well, it, it, it fits so it's fits so perfectly. And, and to, to your point, there is this kind of uh, airiness uh, to to that song. Like it doesn't sound like a really like dead room recorded kind of acoustic song. Like if. Yeah, no, it's it's in the some drum breath to it. Yeah. Yeah. We definitely recorded it in the drum room on, on the same rug and everything as the drums were on. So it kind of has the same space to it that the drums do. Mm -hmm. that, at least that was the plan. <laughs> Oh, I, th I think you su succeeded on, on that. I feel like, um, and to nerd out a little bit here, like the guitar tones, I think on this, this uh, album, they're really like unique sounding. Like there's not a, t I think what I'm trying try to say is like they, they, they don't yield more metal adjacent, like, like high, super high gainy. There's like some layers to it. I don't know how many. There's like, definitely layers, layers to the guitars. Yeah. I think I recorded like four or five different layers of guitar and like varying levels of distortion. Also, we don't use a ton of power chords. Like a lot of the stuff is open chords and big, you know, using all six strings at all the times. So there, there's that kind of vibe to it. It's less jun 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 and more like open singing kind of ringing chords. Yeah, like uh, like jangle, jangly adjacent. Jangly, uh -huh. exactly. Yeah, the '90s jangle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like oh, dude, I miss that. I, I wish I would. I I miss that era so yeah. much. Like those, like and somewhere to your point, like we're stacking like not so super heavy gain guitars. So uh, we're playing all these big chords. So it's, again, I come to this uh, feeling of like airiness of the whole yeah. record. Yeah, totally. That's that's definitely the vibe we're trying to just like a late nineties, I guess emo punk record <laughs> we mm. wanted it to sound classic we didn't want to look back on it when we turned 50 and be like oh man why did we fucking sample the drums and make all these like you know <laughs> we wanted to look back and be like yeah like that sounds like how the band sounds like the drums are all real there's no augmentation with triggers or samples or anything like that it's mm -hmm. just him bashing away in there so oh awesome you don't you really hear that a lot anymore yo know, you know most punk records these days sound like the drummer has Zeus arms in an ice cave. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I do. I, I know what you mean. There's like, it's almost like too perfect. Uh, yeah. And like, some, some and albums. Snare drums should change pitch when you do a roll. Like it shouldn't sound like, like a machine gun. But, yeah, exactly. Like it, it feels so. It feels like a, a human playing it. Um, because yeah, exactly. It might just be because I'm old, but <laughs> uh, no, well, I, I like I can... to hear the snare drum. 
<laughs> I do too. Like a nice, really like poppy snare that like really like hits you. Like it really helps me like when I'm like grooving to a song, like really get into lock, lock in in some way, especially on those sort of like lifetimey sort of like pop to pop to pop to D beat kind of. Yeah, kinda, exactly. Kinda beats. There is a groove to those, to, to that feel. And when you, when you edit it out, it, it makes it super robo. No, so there totally. is we, we call it the two bob groove. It's like one two and one two and one two, and you know there's a groove to that fast playing. <laughs> oh you no, know, there abs it, there absolutely is. Like, like I, I've also heard it called the, like the the app bag of chips and banana rhythm. That sort of no effects kind of rhythm. That that dun 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 kind of. Uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, we definitely thing. when we speak to the drummer, we always speak within bands like. If we want a beat that's no effects beat, that's a doo da doo la doo da doo la doo da doo la. That's no effects. Or the face to face beat, which is doo ka doo doo ka doo doo ka doo doo ka doo doo ka. You know, the halftime. So we mm-hmm. we definitely speak in band to the drummer. <laughs> <laughs> I I I love it. This is the kind of stuff like I'm sure like when I talk to cause when I had friends in college who like were studying music would just like pull their hair out because i'm like yeah you know t- is like i'm like can you give me like a four four and i'm like no i can i can just tell you like this kind of band or this kind of thing like a top to pop to pop yeah pop, pop, pop. uh if you want to feel and vibe that's more important yeah oh yeah feel and vibe is everything <laughs> oh yeah you got to have vibes when it comes to to good punk punk rock music but but similarly to come back to this environment thing i feel like the airiness of the guitars and the recording along with the intensity of the lyrics and and what dan is singing about i feel like that's mm-hmm. vancouver that's the the dichotomy of the city and your, vancouver has your a sound right there. there's like i feel like punk bands in vancouver there's a sound to it there's there's like this melancholiness to the chords that that everyone uses and mm-hmm. like that's what we grew up on so that's kind of you know what we worshiped as kids and that's what we still love no matter what bands like dbs dbs was probably our out of all of us that's probably our favorite band and DBS. uh go, DBS. yeah dbs they were like uh they were started off as a punk band and then they kind of evolved into sort of that braid kind of vibe sound mm-hmm. and uh their last ep is just my favorite thing on the planet <laughs> it's really oh, good is, uh, it's great. called I'm, forget I'm everything you know <laughs> yeah the, the record's called forget everything you know Awesome. I'm going like to like check that out. Song EP. Yeah, it's really good. It's it definitely you'll you'll hear the Vancouver sound in there. Daggermouth had it, Precursor has it, Living with Lions has it. It's this sort of melancholiness to the chords they use. Oh yeah, and I'm, I want to ask you about Daggermouth too because I really like yeah. uh, Turf War. That album was was great. Um, but I'm very interested in this kind of idea of the Vancouver sound because I have uh, an ongoing punk rock doctoral thesis. Again, talking about like where punk, the punk gets made. Like I think pop punk is like per- tailor made for the suburbs because there's not a ton to get too like political about when you're a teenager. At least there wasn't. Uh, for me. Um, and similarly, what I'm curious about, because you're, you grew up in like the Vancouver punk scene of like the, the nineties. Yeah. Late nineties or early two thousands, M- more like, like 2000 on was when I started playing in bands. Okay. And, and yeah. how old were you around that time? I was like 19. Okay. So when I started so actually like... playing bands. I was going to shows when I was like 16, 17, but they were more like, seeing no use for a name and stuff like that at uh sealand hall and i didn't really get into the bar stuff till later on which is where all the bands always play in vancouver there's there wasn't really a ton of all ages stuff back then there was like maybe three places for mm-hmm. all ages but everything else would be in a bar and you'd be screwed until you were 19. oh gotcha but at least so... you only had to be 19 you had to be 21. <laughs> That is true. We do have to be uh, 21. We got a couple arbitrary uh, years in there. Um, and what I'm curious about, and this and this is very much going to be an American Canada question. Um, so like I, when I was like reading about punk, like in D.C. in the 80s, everyone's yelling about Reagan and the government, um, you know, or like dead, dead mm-hmm. Kennedy's like. I feel like a lot of Americans think probably look at canada and think i'll be safe if i go go there everything's great up there so was there anything (laughs) yeah no (laughs) that's so okay so that's why i figure so like is is there is there like a political canadian punk band that like yells about like the rcmp or something like that 
Oh yeah, propaganda. Propaganda. Propaganda is probably the the most political Canadian band ever. <laughs> yeah, they're they're great too. Like technical guitar playing plays mm-hmm. and sings at the same time too. Um, yeah, it's really good. They they've got songs about the CBC about about hockey night in Canada, <laughs> like all kinds of stuff. They're they're uh, they're definitely the best punk band in in Canada, I think, ever. Uh-huh. Yeah, they're yeah. they're they're super good. Oh yeah, I and I, I uh, listened to that one album. Oh, probably how uh, Potemkin City Lights was the last. I think that was the last big one that yeah. I got. Yeah, I and then the one, one with and... the upside down American flag on it. There's oh, that record. I don't, I don't. Oh, I don't know that one. That was today's empire is tomorrow's ashes, and that I think that came around out like just before nine eleven or around that time. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah, and yeah, it had that's... nothing to do with that, but but right. it was just like crazy timing. Yeah, it's again like one of those like crazy like when The Simpsons predicts uh, predicts everything. Yeah, uh, it's like one of those just yeah. like crazy coincidental coincidental things. Um, okay, yeah. so so it was mostly so mostly bar shows so there's no like diy spaces so when you're like there's a few of them they pop up here and there but there's but i just find like when you know bands you want to see coming through they always end up playing at a bar so when i was young i'd be pissed off about that but now whatever (laughs) uh no totally so when did you uh so when you're 19 what was the first band that you joined And, and you were playing guitar in that band yeah, I was a screamo band <laughs> called End This Week with Knives. <laughs> oh, that's a great screamo band name. I yeah, love that. totally. And that, it was that's... it was like Alexis on Fire, but slower and heavier. Uh huh. That's that's yeah. just so perfect. It's like it's like a uh, it's like a line from a a Tumblr post or live journal. Yeah, or... <laughs> yeah totally. Certain, and all the certain... song titles were long and stupid, and it was pretty funny. <laughs> oh, that's yeah. that's awesome. Uh, yeah, did, did that, that one record anything? Yeah, there was a an EP. I I hope it's not out there. I don't think it's out there in the internet world because this was so long ago, pre-internet. I don't think anyone's put it out there yet. Uh-huh. But it was fun. It was a fun band. It was a fun band, but I'm glad it's not readily available. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that was back in the era when you you know the guys used to wear like those wear like women's jeans real tight and like. Mm-hmm. headbands and fucking white belts and all that shit and <laughs> you know the crazy haircuts which i oh, can never yeah. have yeah, yeah. yeah this the super skinny jeans with like the studded belt and that yeah. sort of like vaguely motley crew inspired hair exactly yeah we call like, them uh, swoop, swoops <laughs> yeah yeah the the swoops i i always uh reference the band halifax uh when it comes to to that kind of look Gotcha. They they yeah. always had that perfect kind of swoopy hair, and, and I could never, yeah. I could never do it. I always grew when I I used to have hair down to my shoulders, and it was like yeah. metal. It was metalhead hair. It was I could never do the full like, uh, MySpace scene kid look. <laughs> I could never do it because I started going bald when I was like sixteen. <laughs> I was oh no! Off. <laughs> yeah, that's oh, okay. So, uh, so you just had to like lean into hats. Hats always. Yeah, shaved head and hat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm 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 leaning into I, I've started doing like hats on on stage for for music gigs because I sweat so much on stage. Oh yeah, especially Keeps it like, out of your eyes. Yeah, like this. Like we're three songs in. We were playing this place. Uh, my band was playing this place in Queens, and the AC wasn't on. Oh and yeah, was, and I was like on stage wondering like, why am I sweating so much? Because I'm like, because uh, when I get hot, I just I'm drenched. So I start wearing the hat to like keep it out of my eyes. Um, and then I found out, oh, the AC wasn't on for most of the set. I Daggermouth played with Have Heart, I think it was, in Arizona in this small, tiny club. And there was no AC. The AC was broken. And it was over 100 degrees outside. And so inside, you weren't allowed to mosh. You weren't allowed to do anything. And it was so hot. I couldn't even hold my pick. It just kept flying out of my hand. It was so hot and so sweaty in there. Oh man, I I might have to start wearing like wristbands, like uh, yeah. you know, like workout bands. That'll be my next <laughs> yeah. my next move. Yeah. Hundred degrees. That sounds dangerous. Like it was it's... so hot. Yeah, it was so hot that the we we bought soda 
and we had them sitting in the van. And by the time we came back out, all the water had evaporated out of the soda bottle. And it was just like this goo left in the bottom. <laughs> it was shit. hot. And we're not that used to the heat. We, ne- we don't like the, you know, the hottest it gets here is like, used to be like around 30 degrees Celsius, which I don't know what that is in, in Fahrenheit, but it's uh, not that it's, hot. Yeah. I think 30 is like, uh, probably in like 80 degrees, 90 degrees Fahrenheit. I, I can't do the conversion off the top of my head, but yeah, it's, it's like not, not that it's tolerable. It, yeah. Tolerable. Once you get up to 50 Celsius, oh. that's like the danger. That's like the danger. Yeah. Zone. It hit 45 degrees celsius out were in vancouver like maybe two years ago and it was punishing i was recording a band in my garage and like all of us are just in our underwear it was so hot (laughs) and and i've and i've heard that vancouver is kind of lucky when it comes to canadian weather because it never really ever gets that cold i've heard like i've been there during the winter and it's only like like it's cold but it's not like eastern canada cold like yeah no in vancouver it'll zero the coldest it gets is like minus 10 at, and that'll be for like a day, you know, mm-hmm. and we get snow like maybe two times a year. That's, right. it's, yeah. Vancouver is like the Canadian California. It's, just, you know, it's, <laughs> except it rains all the time. <laughs> that, that, that's why I've heard. Uh, uh, I've heard it called rain Coover. Yeah. Uh, rain city, Vancouver. Yeah. Or rain Coover. Yeah. It's always, always raining. And that's, uh-huh. that sucks. But, it is what it is. I'd rather have rain than snow. Oh yeah, I, the trade-offs for uh, for temperate climate, I I suppose. <laughs> yeah, um, for sure. So so you do this. So you do this first uh, emo band, and then how soon after that? Because I assume like that solidified. Like I'm gonna do music. Was is oh that yeah, the case? for sure. And like pretty much a week after that band was done was when Dagger Mouth started. Okay, so, so it was, like, it was like quick, soon. right into it. Yeah, and then I was, we were on tour for pretty much four years straight, like 2000, I feel like 2004 to like 2008. I don't think I was really home. We were just wow, touring you, constantly. Just in the van? Yeah, we, and we just always wanted to do uh, West Coast, California. We, we didn't really, only toured Canada a couple times. Everything was always in the States. Because you think about it you you have more people in california than we have in our whole country and that is that is true that is true yeah and 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 your entire population is right by the border yeah and our average drive is like you know 10 hours eight to 10 hours between major cities whereas if we just pop down the west coast our drives are like two hours the longest drive we do is san fran to la because there's not really much to play between there but you know from seattle and then you go to Oregon and then the top of California, there's lots of cool little places to play. Mm-hmm. No. Yeah. Especially like in like the Berkeley area, like around the, the Bay area. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. We, uh, what the hell? We played Gilman. We slept in Gilman street one night. <laughs> oh, Bull you rats. got to play. <laughs> you, you... <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. I mean that, that tracks for, uh, Gilman street. Um, Oh yeah. It was wild. <laughs> It was great. We cl- I got to climb the rafters, and they still had an original Green Day poster up there when they were called Sweet Children. It was, like, glued to the ceiling. It was pretty cool. We we definitely did a lot of exploring. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, because yeah. that place is, like, a living museum, I think, for, for oh, Punky Street. Like, Green Day, Jawbreaker. Like, every fucking cool band came out of it. Everyone played, played there. there. Yeah, and then the last time Daggermouth played there, Billy Joe from Green Day had bought a huge PA system and put a new PA system in there. I guess they, they played a show there for their friends and family after the 86 was removed so they could play there again. And he left this wicked PA. It was crazy. It sounded way better. <laughs> <laughs> That's I, I had heard that they, they did that. That's really cool. You, you were there right afterwards. How, how was that show? Was it like a just crazy, super crazy show? Yeah, it was awesome. It was super fun. Um, it was pretty full. Lots of like people stage diving and having a good time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I loved it. I love playing California. Uh, we've never had a bad, bad show ever in California. Oh yeah, uh, I've been yeah I've been there a couple times recently, and I feel like uh, punk is still like real m- much more popular than it is in New York. Certainly, um, yeah. Like in in New York, like people come out for like the for big for big shows, like when Blink yeah. or Green Day come through town. But I feel like 
I get I get a lot of compliments like walking around LA or San Diego of like my blink shirt or my rancid shirt or That's what have you. So I'm like I'm like okay, all right, cool. I'm not uh I'm not the only the only one anymore. This feels nice. I yeah, well, California is. I mean, that's the birthplace of of do da do la punk of all the fast punk bands. You know, they all started there. Strung oh, out, yeah. no facts, good riddance, all that stuff. But mm-hmm. you guys yeah, got the, the movie life and I'm Avalanche, though. Yes, we do. Yes, we yeah. we do have those, and we have like uh, we uh, benefit from that that New Jersey DIY scene that brought you like. That brought like Lifetime, uh, Gas, Gaslight my. Anthem, My Chemical Romance, like tons of great stuff comes out of uh, out of New Jersey for sure. Totally, yeah, and Philly as well. Was was Kid Dynamite? Was Philly right? Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure. Uh, I'm I'm gonna check it while we're talking because my other favorite band that comes out of came out of uh, of Philly is the Menzingers. Yep, Menzingers are great. Yeah, I I love them. Yeah, Kid Dynamite were uh, were from Philly, Philly as, right? Yeah. as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, uh, I just saw I a couple of weeks ago. I saw Green Day in New York, and then I went. We went. My wife and I went. And saw them in Philadelphia. And oh, nice! It was a gr- a great show. But Philly, because uh, Rancid are opening, and Philly like went off for Rancid. That's rad. Like, they got such a great a uh, a great response um, compared to New York, which I was honestly surprised by. Um, but they Philly loved Rancid. That was really cool to cool to see. I love it. Rancid. I love Rancid too. They're great. Yeah. Um, when Daggermouth played LA, what uh places uh did you play? Where does uh punk where did punk happen? It was LA Chain Reaction. We played there a couple times. Mm-hmm. Uh Chain Reaction's wicked. That's in Anaheim. And then we play I can't remember. It's been so long. I can't remember the venues and stuff. But we always played with uh Final Fight. That was the band we'd always play with. And they were Final great. Fight. Yeah. Yeah. They were like a fast hardcore band. Yeah. We played everywhere. We played Pomona, which is like just outside of LA. And we play like backyard parties where the police helicopters came and there's people skateboarding in the pool. <laughs> it, it was pretty oh fun. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. I've seen that in music videos. I, I had no idea it really happened. That's oh, so yeah. Sick. It happened. They came twice. They came the first time in the. The guy got a warning and told that he'd have to pay for the police helicopter on the second time. And then they they came back again. And we were playing with, I can't remember the hardcore band. It was a bunch of big, big, scary looking dudes. <laughs> but we were playing. We we're like, shit, we're, this is getting shut down. And I was like, you guys want to go song for song? So like, they'd play a song. We'd run out, plug our guitars in. We'd play a song. They'd run out, <laughs> plug their shit in. They'd, and we just went back and forth song for song until it got shut down. <laughs> because <laughs> we knew it was going to happen so we wanted to make oh, sure that we were the last two bands to play for the day it was like a big festival like you know the whole street was just vans and trailers so it was pretty fun oh that's that sounds so so cool i i love that that spirit i feel like this i feel like uh punk is unique in that like i don't see a ton of like jazz festivals that happen in in the street you know like i see no, busters, yeah. but uh, i don't see like the jazz scene that comes to or the r&b scene really come together do some like diy like uh vo- vocal acapellas and stuff like that yeah for sure it was rad i think we played pomona again but we played in someone's garage and it was less crazy <laughs> <laughs> i can imagine it's like oh there's so- there's tools yeah, exactly. And and it was much quieter, although I guess we did have the door open, but it, but playing in the backyard with the with the pool and people skateboarding and it was just chaos. It was really fun. Oh, that's that's uh amazing. Did Daggermouth ever play uh like Europe or uh or Asia? Yep. Yeah, that w- it was in the later years like it, Daggermouth broke up for a long time and our at that time, the singer didn't want to do it, so I sang for the Europe tour and for the Japan tour, and for we played the uh, fest in Florida. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so, I so I had to do it, and that fuck that job is not easy. I threw up on stage almost every night because you're trying to get water down, but the vocals are so fast, I just end up barfing every time. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Couldn't get it done. Oh but my it was god, fun. yeah, yeah. I had a good no... time. No, fest fest sounds uh ama- amazing. I'm gonna get down there uh, for it someday. They follow they followed the podcast. I, I don't know if they if fest. Oh, needs a po- I don't know if fest needs a podcast for uh 
<laughs> for, they should. For one they year. should. I don't know if they do it, but they should do one for the during the fest. That'd be rad. Yeah, yeah. I was. I think it'd be cool. I could just do like basically like a live thing. I would probably like make it more like uh, focused on like being funny because uh, there's yeah w- there would be people there. You know, bu- bust out a couple of acoustic songs uh, from from totally. guests. I think I feel like people would be interested in this for sure <laughs> and and it would give you something to watch and listen to when you're sitting in the, your crappy hotel room after the show's done at night although most people are drinking till like four in the morning <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's exactly my my thought is like you're trying to have like a conversation it's just like Wah! yeah oh and it's, and it's florida so it's fucking wild we stayed oh, at a yeah. hotel called called america's best and there was blood stains all over the mattress. It was insane. We figured someone must have gotten stabbed in there. Oh, Crack oh pipe my... burns on the sink and the whole nine. Oh, good good times. That is definitely a <laughs> metaphor for what what I lived through the last four years. <laughs> yeah, it's it it was wild. The fest was great though. I, I really enjoy it. The food's good around there too. Like mm. they they really have it well done. Just the hotels oh. are a little, a little, a little shady. Oh, but most, 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 uh, <laughs> most definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, hey, if you're, are we, are we doing punk music if we're not like va- vaguely risking our safety? Oh, exactly. <laughs> Stu, exactly. You know what I mean? Just the irony was it was called America's Best. <laughs> oh, it was, <laughs> it, it was, it was, per, it was. That's that's just, just chef's kiss. Uh, yeah. Too perfect. Perfect. Yeah hot as hell and the pool is empty <laughs> oh good and i could just I'm, I'm picturing it like walter white's pool in breaking bad after he gets he has to leave his house it's just like totally spray painted over and like it's all grunged out yeah no this one wasn't but that would be rad <laughs> <laughs> um so so you did this for like like four years of, of touring in Daggermouth, like at, yeah, at for, well, two thousand four to two thousand eight, we toured hard. Like that was the original lineup, and like uh-huh. we we just we'd go out for like three weeks, come home for like a week, and then be out for three weeks. Sometimes we'd be out on tour, and then get a tour offered to us while we we're on that one, so that we had to figure out how to get to the other tour from where we were. I've, wow. I think we drove one time. We drove from Kansas City to L.A. in one shot. <laughs> Which was like a long fucking drive. That that's a Canada drive. That's like Vancouver to Calgary. It, it was fuck. It was longer. I think it took us like over twenty four hours to make it. It was a long uh, drive. Oh, you should especially like when you're going through the the mid the Midwest. It's just fields for like eight hours. Uh, yeah, of... that's pretty much what Canada's like the whole way. <laughs> <laughs> From like once you leave leave uh, BC or Van, like where Vancouver is. You hit prairies and you're just prairies all the way until you get to Ontario. Mm-hmm. So there, my, there's really not much to see. Yeah, my my wife has uh, travels to Canada a, a bit for, uh, for for work sometimes, and she'll uh, she'll like text me from like Edmonton. Uh, and oh just, yeah, and and uh, although I think the last time she was in Edmonton, it was when the, the Stanley Cup final was happening. So I think she oh, kind of got that skewed. Crazy. Uh, dude okay so i i i know i'm gonna i gotta digress a little bit that i watched that's the first time i've watched like an entire seven game series of hockey in a while that's not how it was supposed to end no (laughs) that is not that is not the good that is not the miracle story that is not the good sports story where florida like where edmonton come back and then the and then game seven they drop it (laughs) yep no is yeah that was a heartbreaker for sure and edmonton those are hockey fans. They, you know, like they're crazy, crazy about hockey there. Mm-hmm. So they must have been just bummed. Unlike Vancouver, where everyone just lights the city on fire when we lose. <laughs> oh yeah, you know. Well, you know, Philadelphia burns whether the team wins or loses. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> good old fashioned riot. Oh yeah, who doesn't love a, a good riot? I've, I've uh, although I have um. I have attended a soccer game in South America as well as a oh, big crazy dirt as well as a big uh I've attended Arsenal Tottenham in England. That feels pretty dangerous too. I bet. Yeah. I can never get into soccer. I tried. I just can't do it. We we, we now, call soccer grass ballet up here. 
That's a that's a good one. I have I haven't heard grass ballet before. That's I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna use use that. It's very much like like once once you know what you're what once I started like watching it what I for a particular reason, I mm-hmm. got more I got more into it. I also get really invested, um, not so much always in the game itself, but uh, the culture behind the fans of each team. Yeah. And like the history of like why they're so passionate about this team, like like teams in like like ports like Portsmouth in England, like mm-hmm. super lower level team, but like really diehard fans, and like what's the history behind that? That's that, funny. That That's where our is... Daggermouth singers from is Portsmouth. Oh, really? <laughs> original, original singer Nick. He's, that's where he lives. Yeah, he was born there. Oh, I didn't know that. I, I bet he's <laughs> yeah. a fan of that. I bet he's a fan of of their that team then. Oh, he's got to be. Yeah, for sure. Soccer's actually gotten a lot bigger in Vancouver since we we got the white caps going again. Mm-hmm. Pretty hard. And like soccer's picked up quite a bit. Like they play in in the big stadium here now. Oh, that's is, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm ha- I'm I'm happy to hear that. I'm just happy for anything to like be growing the uh soccer in North in North America. Anything yeah. uh, I think will will be helpful there. So that's that's yeah. rad. I'm glad that uh Vancouver is embracing, uh, em- embracing the Whitecaps. So, yep. so when, so did, when Daggermouth, uh, ends, like, it doesn't seem like Daggermouth ended like, uh, acrimoniously. It seems like it was just kind of like everybody sort of moved on or what was that time? Oh, like? everyone, everyone hated each other at the end. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, I guess it was like maybe four or five years later, we tried to get it back together, but the singer wouldn't do it. So I was like, fuck it. I'll just sing then. And we'll just get another guitar player. And okay. we just did that just because we wanted to go and tour and have fun. And then at the end of that, it just was kind of fizzled out. And we're, I, I don't really have a desire to do dagger mouth anymore. Mm-hmm. It's fun. But to me, like, it sounds like I, I can, I just hear the 20 year oldness of it. You know, mm-hmm. like some of the lyrics are pretty cheesy and, and that kind of stuff. But it's so fun to do, but I don't know. I just feel like Precursor is like the next evolution of that sound for me. Like it still has Daggermouth vibes, but it's a little more like minor key and the the vocals are a little more harder and I just like it better. Oh, most, most <laughs> definitely. And this is, and I'm very, um, I, I understand uh, that sort of that split uh, completely because Obviously, and I think like that's actually a sign of personal growth because if you are continuing to relate to the songs that like you were writing and singing when you're in your twenties, um, then that would mean not much has has changed. But when you can look back on it and like, okay, that's who I was and what I was making then, and that's a part of me. But what I want to make now is is this, and that is, uh, and that's precursor. Yeah, it's. It's Daggermouth riffs in minor keys. <laughs> like it's a lot more like <laughs> sad sounding chords and but there's still there's still all the like we call them nuges, the two string bends, and there's lots of like little daggermouth moments in there. But it just feels like Daggermouth written by forty and fifty year old men rather than twenty year old boys. <laughs> oh, for for sure. And and very similarly, this is something else I was thinking about as well. Like kind of like the difference between like your, your teenage young adult angst and the idea that like, I think I remember being a, a, a younger adult and thinking, well, someday I'll, I'll check all of these boxes and then I won't feel bad ever again. And yeah. then you, you start, you get late thirties, like forties and you're like, Oh, this is where like I learn about how to feel bad about so many more different things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You're not just bummed about girlfriends and, and like, friends treating you bad now you're now you got political stuff going on and and you got friends addicted to drugs and you know suicides and things like that like grown-up shit yeah exactly like and then like you start there's that's that sort of like creeping existential uh dread that starts happening once you start realizing okay i think i've lived longer than i have left uh sometimes is <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> that's coming that sucks <laughs> yeah that's yeah that's a that's a, like a rough thing to to process and luckily there's yeah. there's art in in order to process it uh there's <laughs> for sure like i i we're most of us in the band are 
you know, mid forties, mid to late forties and like early fifties. And mm. like, yeah, every time we make a record, because I've made records with Dan's other bands and stuff too. Every time we make a record, we're like, shit, this could be the last one, you know? Like, it always feels like this might be the last record I ever make. Like, and that's that's a shitty feeling. <laughs> but you yeah, always put it, your, your heart into it, right? Oh, of of course, absolutely, absolutely. I still like it. A lot of my friends from I, I'm still doing like kind of the same shit I've been doing since, since high school. Like I still like love making cool things with my friends. You know, I do, do, com- do comedy and I have that part of my life. Uh, I talk to people, I talk to cool people like you. This allows me the uh, ability to make friends in a, in an interesting way. Cause adult friendship yeah. is hard. Oh, for and, sure. Uh, um, and, and, and similarly, like I, there's, uh, there's like outlets of like, of, I, I love the feeling of like making a thing and then sharing it with people. That really is what brings me like a lot of joy is, yeah. is that moment. And For sure. that sort of t- has taken on a lot of different forms. Um, and, and similar to, I think what your, your point was, um, what you're talking about earlier. Um, I love the riffs on, on this new record to story. Like similarly, oh, like thanks, there's, man. there's such, so like those little like do, 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 like, well that there's like a cool punk groove going on. Like there's like a, where's the calorie was another one. I thought it was like, this is a really cool lead riff on yeah. top of a really like blasting kind of do, 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 do punk song. Yeah, for sure. And that's all just evolution from, Daggermouth stuff like i still feel like the riff is king musically it has to sound good without vocals i have to be interested in it without vocals mm-hmm. for it to be like a good song for me i can't just like have chords it's it just doesn't work for me <laughs> you gotta have some some leads and some kind of like riff to it yeah because i think those melodies are what i think really make a song memorable that's something i'm trying to uh get understand a little bit more is like those like little sing parts you can sing like in a riff or a a solo yeah all things that go into making a song memorable including like a lyric that i think you can touch somebody's heart which i think dan is doing a really uh great job at especially because he's just like (laughs) splaying himself out lyric lyrically yeah for sure and he always does that his his other band carpenters same way like the lyrics are always so good and and really draw you in but yeah he, he was actually he was actually complaining when we did this record at the beginning because we we did we never write songs with vocals in mind we just write it to sound good as an instrumental punk track and he's like mm-hmm. some of this shit isn't even four times through it's like you're going three times on one part one time on another part and he's like what the hell am i supposed to do I'm like you'll figure it out and he did <laughs> yeah, it's just like where where's where's the chorus? Like it's wherever you need, want it. It's to be. wherever you want it to be. Yeah, you can pick the part that you want to be the chorus. <laughs> We're fine with that. That yeah. that's that's an int- that is an interesting uh, approach to the songwriting uh, process. The yeah, I, we I, we wrote the music this. first, and then and then he had to figure it out to the music after. There's a few little things we changed for him, like you know, if he wanted, like I think uh, for the. No, it was uh, All Those Nights, which is like the most verse, chorus, verse, chorus of them all. That one mm-hmm. wasn't like that originally, and we extended a couple parts to make it work with what he wanted to do uh-huh. vocally. So he he bent us on that song. But gotcha. the rest we, the rest is all pretty much how we wrote it, which is just chaos that he needs to figure out. Mm-hmm. And so do you think, and, and so like when he's recording vocals in, in the, in the studio, like when it comes time to, to melodies, is there, there are there times where he has to kind of change the melody that he has for, or the way he sings something so that it fits like the instrumental parts? Yeah, for sure. He, he definitely is the one who has to be molded to the most, like he has to follow what, what's there. So yeah, there was a few things that we changed for sure. Mm-hmm. And like, I'd also just hear something in my head and be like, oh, what if we tried this? And and he's always game for that stuff. Like we did a Ray Capo yell on there, uh-huh. like a, rah, 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 on one of the songs. And like, <laughs> he would, he would never do that, but he loved it after. 
Um, that's that's amazing. I I also wanted to ask when it comes to like producing a a, a singer, I imagine that there's I've always thought of it as like like when you're a director working with an actor like you're trying to get them to the place uh that the song needs to be so that their performance uh is supporting the intention of the song lyrically yep. and musically um do you have where is there anything that you do like when you're in the studio other than like blank slate when he's actually recording anything that you do to like kind of get him into a certain place mentally before going into the booth me and Dan have worked together for so long that we don't have to do any of that stuff. Like I've recorded his other band three records, I think. And then the previous precursor record. So I think we've done like five, five or six records together. So he's easy. He just needs an apple and a bag of Ricola candies and ginger <laughs> ale. And he's good to go. And, that, that, and that he's good. I never, I never have to like give him any, any kind of like character prompts like, Oh, you need to be more into it or whatever. He's always into it for me. I just try to, I try to not show emotion. Like when shit's not going right. If, if he's having a bad day, I don't want him to like pick up on me thinking he stinks that day or whatever, you know? Mm -hmm. So I try to always be positive, I guess. <laughs> oh yeah. Positive <laughs> reinforcement. But yeah, no, he's, he's such a pro. He never has to worry about that. He's, if he's got his Ricola's and his ginger ale, he's, he's a good man. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. That's, uh, that's what gets, gets him through. I, I, that's uh, his combo. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my singer is, uh, I like to, I, I imagine we're, we're planning to record another single this, this fall. I'm going to make sure I have some tea and hot water handy Yeah, uh, for him. Yeah, that works too. Yeah, and and if you got a screamer, so like you know, doing poison the well screaming, mm -hmm. chocolate milk, <laughs> chocolate milk works good. <laughs> Gets a lot of phlegm in the throat, so then they uh -huh. don't have to try to push so hard, and you can still get that throaty that, distortion that out of it. Yeah, that yeah, exactly. yeah, <laughs> you got it. Yeah, chocolate milk. <laughs> Fasc fascinating. That is that is so. Uh, atypical to like what i hear people say uh, oh yeah they usually say no dairy because it's terrible for you but if if they're only screaming and and they're like losing their voice chocolate milk will help gives it a bit of coating on there and it'll give you a couple more hours oh, which is nice <laughs> oh that's yeah. fast that's fascinating uh, i'm yeah. learning so much from this conversation Stuart. um <laughs> <laughs> i only do that if i have to you know like Sure. Water is always the best, but you know, when yeah. you run out of, when you run out of shit to drink, chocolate milk will work if you're screaming. <laughs> Amazing. Um, yeah. when it, when it comes to, to you and, and, uh, recording guitars, do you have guitars that you only use in the studio versus when you do live or are they the same? It's the same. I just use the same. I've had my same guitar for a long time. It's a Gibson 335 with just one EMG in the bridge. That's it. No knobs, no pots no nothing it's just an input jack to the emg and that's it oh, and nice. then a box yeah. car racer special exactly and it it sounds great and it's i used to play less paul but it's too heavy and i'd always be ripping the strap pins out of it no matter what from mm -hmm. jumping and the 335 is way lighter and it's bigger so you can kind of tuck it under your arm when you jump uh -huh. so it doesn't doesn't rip out the pegs as often Gotcha. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's handy. That's, that's handy bit of, of, of news there. And, and why do you like the, the, the EMG? Is there a particular it's sound just, effect? It's the Judd Judd hardcore sound. Mm -hmm. I, and I love it. And it makes all my amps sound good. Um, I don't have to work as hard. It makes me sound like I'm a better player. <laughs> it makes, <laughs> makes me even, which is nice. Yeah. I just, I've always used them and I, Anytime I don't use them, I just, I play differently. I'm, I'm so used to like being able to dig in and palm mute with those and, mm -hmm. and they just sound beefy. Yeah. I've, I still use the EMG 81 in my bridge. I've, since I was like 16, <laughs> it's nice. always been in there. Yeah. Very cool. One more kind of obscure, uh, audio engineer kind of question. Have you ever played around this, this is based off of a YouTuber I follow. Have you ever played around with speakers and cabinets before? Oh yeah. Yep. Uh, my old debt when dagger mouth days, I used to have, uh, two greenbacks and two vintage thirties and an X pattern in my cab. And I actually used to have two separate input jacks for each, like one input jack for the 
the greenbacks and one for the vintage 30s and mm-hmm. i used to play a jcm 800 and a 5150 into one 412 cab oh wow <laughs> so you like yeah. just really loading that cab up as much as you can oh yeah <laughs> yeah it was it was ignorant <laughs> but and <laughs> it wound up being too much shit to drag around on tour so it only lasted a few tours of like that i got sick mm-hmm. of loading it and none of the guys want to help you load it when they're like, why are you fucking bringing this shit? <laughs> like, you can load oh. that yourself. Oh, I, I know what you mean. I have like one of those like super tiny, like fit in your backpack base heads. And in, oh, New, yeah. York, in New York, lots of times they a place will provide you the back line. So I just go in, pop a cable in. Everyone's like nice. working their rack mounts and all of their. Uh, and like, I, I haven't seen this in a while, but you remember the fridge base cabinet? Oh, yeah. Like, we only use the fridge. <laughs> i'm so glad that i said it and you knew exactly what i was talking oh yeah about. yeah that, it's it's funny we, we joke around all the time we're like little lamps those are for the kids like we still bring 412s with a tube head we still haul all that old shit into the club even precursor <laughs> we still all of us still have 412s and our bass player still has a fridge Oh, fantastic. That is that, yeah. that to me that like like people talk about bygone eras of music that to me, that's my like wall of Marshall amps in the 80s is that the fridge and the four by 12. Oh, yeah. One cab. Yeah. We've even been talking about getting an uh, full stacks, but but we don't have a van. We because we're all like, you know, older guys, everyone's dad's the best we got some minivan. <laughs> like, how are we going to uh-huh. fit four cabs and a fridge in a minivan? It's not going to happen. So oh, we haven't yeah. done it yet. Yeah, and no, on the that's recording, a hard tough gig. The on the recording, the the irony of all this is the recording. There's no cabinet on our recording on the record. It's we use the tube head into um, like a load box, and then we just use um, a neural DSP cab, a Soldano cab in the computer. Because I record in my garage and I live in like a townhouse, so I can't have like super loud amps. So that's how we recorded the record, which is. Ask backwards from what we actually believe in, <laughs> but it, it it gets the the record made, which is the uh, most exactly. Important and we're thing. still using tube tube amps, right? Like it goes a tube amp into this little box that hooks up to my computer, so we still are using a tube amp, but just no cabinet. Amazing. Has yeah. has pre has um so that I want to I want to uh, understand has Precursor uh, toured much because. Thick and Thin is, is out now. Is there going to be like any shows behind uh, the album? Yeah, we, we'll probably do a little Canadian tour, probably like keep a small West Coast Canada. It's so hard to get into the States now. Like it's expensive to get the visas. So yeah, realistically, we probably would. Like we'd go down for like, if we got offered to play Fest or something like that, we would we would go down and kind of snaggle our way in through the border to say we're going to the show, you know, and then rent guitars there or something. Although I'm left-handed, so it makes it very difficult for me to rent a guitar. <laughs> oh no, yeah, that's a, yeah, that's a bummer. I'm left-handed, but I I, I learned right-handed because the guitar guy was like, "You're not going to be able to find left-handed guitars. Just learn to play right." I was like, "That's okay. what they that's what they tried to do with me." And I kept turning it over, and I just learned how to play guitar upside down on a right-handed one with uh-huh. the strings backwards until the I could afford stiff. to buy my own. Yeah, and um, it, and it it works. But now, now I can play a right-handed guitar or a left-handed guitar, but I prefer to uh, play a left-handed guitar. <laughs> for for sure. I, I'm so b- bummed. I was talking to um, um my buddy Luke, who plays in a great band called uh, Calling All Captains. Oh, but, yeah, I know them. Yep. Uh, okay. And and he was telling me, uh, he re- like really went through the deals of just how difficult um, the United States has made it for Canadian bands to tour. Oh, yeah. And... It's so expensive now. It's super. It's super expensive, and there's every. They're so suspicious. Uh, it makes it difficult to like sell sell merch. Whereas I think Canada has made it easier for Americans. Easier, to, yeah. To come. You just have to have a good merch company right over the border. We used to use uh, Josh from Broadway Calls. I don't know if you know that band. I do. I I know. Broadway yeah, Calls. yeah. Josh used to have a, a screen printing place in uh, Longview, Washington. So. When Daggermouth would go over the border, we would just have no merch with us because they make try to make you pay tax on the merch and stuff. If mm-hmm. you know, make you prove that it's all can, made in Canada or the states. So we just get it from Josh and just play one Seattle show, hit Longview, and we're good. We got merch for the rest of the tour, and it just uh, made life way easier. So those guys should just get merch made in the states and pick it up. Yeah, so much easier. 
Oh yeah, that's that sounds like the 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 move for sure. Yeah, um, and it's cheaper too because Merchant Canada is expensive. It's like you know eighteen bucks a T-shirt to make. Eesh. Yeah, that's, some that's... places sixteen to eighteen bucks depending on your design. Oh man, you you don't must be better off like just buying a bunch of blank sh- blank shirts and then take and then learning how to screen print them. Yeah, for sure. And some bands do that. There there are a few places around, but it's just our t shirt costs are high here. I don't know what it is. I don't I don't know the details of of why it's so expensive, but it's it's crazy how much merch is here. Oh, that's everything's that's expensive here. Even our cheese and milk is like way more expensive than America. Yeah. E- even the bag milk. Oh yeah, everything. Milk is crazy here, and so same with cheese, houses, everything. Canada's very expensive. Oh man, oh man. Yeah, that's 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 br- that's brutal. Yeah, I, I I feel like I might listen to a few of this. That this might break some bubbles on uh on a few people's move to Canada plans. <laughs> oh yeah, like Vancouver, to rent a, an apartment is like at least two grand for a one bedroom apartment a month. Yeah. Oh, that's... And to to buy a house here is like two million for a house. It'll be like a teardown shitter. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This it's... is not even getting into all those nice houses I see in the mountains and stuff. Oh yeah, no, those are like thirty million dollars. <laughs> like it's crazy. Oh, Canada that's... is wild for housing. I feel like housing is part of our economy or something. Like of of you know, it's it's part of how we make money here, which is just ridiculous Uh well that's going to be that'll be the next uh, thing propaganda could write could write about as yeah uh, i'm sure they already have (laughs) (laughs) if if somebody knows is a big propaganda fan send me that that song i'm sure it exists (laughs) yeah i'm sure it does too (laughs) um well dude i've really enjoyed getting to to chat with you i want to make sure that we 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 plug uh, here and then i have one more uh question that's like selfishly for me for me so yeah no worries so uh thick and th- precursors new album thick and thin is available now wherever you get your uh music is there anything else we can plug uh for the band while we're here uh not that i can think of if you if you want to go fast and you and you enjoy a little bit of emo have a listen to the record oh and it is <laughs> I, I it's a a wonderful album like i i listened to that first song and then i i got curious to listen to the rest and i was like i got to talk to somebody from this band this is a really great great oh that's song. awesome well i'm glad you did it's it's lovely to meet you like likewise and um the one thing i wanted to to ask you before we uh, get out here so um i i think i've alluded to that I, I play in a band and we were um planning to record a single sometime this fall um right. of a song that like we know we know it super well it's when we played live um any uh any advice you can give me uh before we we go in to record this make uh, sure your drummer can play to a click track make sure you can play <laughs> to a click track all right that, yeah. yeah i mean that's that's how i like to record it the whole band live off the floor at once to the mm-hmm. click track and then we just replace everything except for the drums but then you get the feel of everybody playing together to the click gotcha like the drums are like the first thing like so you keep those and then you do your guitars on on top yeah. of that yeah yeah, and I always record guitars before bass because I have a harder time hearing if the bass is in tune when there's no guitar there against it. So I record guitars first, then record bass. Awesome. Okay, so we'll do so we'll do guitars first. I think that when we did our first single, we did we did that as well. Yes. Yeah. I was also trying to to see if I could get my uh, the guy we're going to record with uh, about maybe like doing a couple layers of guitars. Like most of my home oh, yeah. demos are like one track because I'm just trying to get the idea of the song. Yeah. But when you're recording like guitars, you, you want it. If you want it to sound like fuller, you want like four tracks or at least two tracks. Yeah. And, and if you want it to sound like, like that modern big guitar sound, then you want to do like a, a track of humbucker on each side and then a track of single coil on each side. So for ours, we did, like the 335 hump which has the emg that was on each side and then i have a jazz master that has a single coil and so that's on each side as well so there's okay. actually like six guitars playing at one time because our other guitar player then adds his stuff on top oh <laughs> so, got it yeah but you want you basically you want a humbucker and a single coil blended together that's what gives you that modern guitar sound Awesome. Well, I definitely yeah. have access to to both of those, and then I love like a good clean sound for for single coils. Uh, oh depending. yeah. Uh, like yeah. I love a good like slightly uh, like edge of breakup Telecaster. 
I really yep. like that. Tellies are great. They're nice and sharp sounding. Mm-hmm. I like Jazzmaster. That's my favorite right now. Jazzmaster. I also gotten really big into shoegaze music, so I've been stacking the Russian big muffs and <laughs> blasting the Jazzmaster through it. That that tracks for that for for shoegaze for sure. Yeah. I what real quick we were uh, we get out here like I think it's a law in Brooklyn at, at least at, from what I've observed that if you are in a band you have to have a Jaguar or a Jazzmaster like yep. I like I don't think you're allowed to play a show without one of those guitars because they're see... cool as fuck looking though I love them I love I, Offset they... Body oh I I do too I got a a slight I got a an Offset uh relatively recently I'll show you when we we get off here, but, um, uh, yeah. I love, I love jazz. I, I, I've played a jazz master a few times and I, I might have to, I might have to think about using one. So <laughs> I love it. I love the big body. It feels like you're playing a bass guitar with a guitar neck on it. It's, it's wicked. Oh yeah. I, I like a big guitar though. <laughs> well, the ES335. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's a, that's yeah. A, you can hide one. behind it when you're a little guy. <laughs> oh, <laughs> if no, you get stage absolutely. fright, you just kind of hide behind it. <laughs> um, well, Stuart, thank you so much for uh, for doing this. Uh, the album's great. Uh, I love the band, and uh, I hope this isn't the only time uh, we chat. This was yeah, uh, for sure, been really fun. Uh, thank, thank you so you much so for much. doing this. This has been great. No problem. Thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. All right, folks, that is Stuart McKillop of Precursor. Their new album, Thick and Thin, is now available everywhere you get your music. If you love Hard on Your Sleeve, emotional hardcore, reminiscent of the uh, 90s East Coast scene, Precursor is your jam. And uh, I had a great time talking to Stuart. I thought it was incredibly insightful. Learned a lot uh, about recording as well as the creative process behind uh, this record. Uh, So again, Precursor, uh, get it everywhere. Uh, you listen to your music. And thank you all for checking out the show today. If you enjoyed this podcast and think you know a friend who would be interested in it as well, you can send them to awesomedisaster.com. That has links to everything related to me. And you can follow me on Instagram, willcarry23, as well as check out Skip Lag's new single, Rhode Island, which is available everywhere you stream your music. And continue to take this feeling of joy and inspiration if you're feeling it and carry that through the next few months because it will be a battle and it will require our time, our energy and our dedication and, and a lot more to, I think personally, secure the future of this country that I think we are taking back uh, the idea of patriotism uh, after this, uh, this last round at the DNC. And um, thank you all again so much for being here. And I'll see you next time between awesome and disaster. Take care, everybody.